Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Breeze Time with Kathy. I'm so glad to be here with you today. I'd like to share some uh, reflections and some pictures and some history about a place I visited, oh, a number of years ago now. It's uh, Istanbul. And uh, the nice thing about history is that we make new history every day. Old history doesn't change too much. We may learn more about it but it's still something I hope you can enjoy. I'd like to share with you some of my memories from the day, a day I spent in Istanbul a number of years ago. Istanbul, of course, is located in Turkey. Turkey stands between Europe and Asia, actually sort of straddles the border between Europe and Asia. And, uh, much of its coastline is on the Mediterranean Sea and the Black Sea. It sits here at a crossroads, a very vital and important place uh, between Turkey and, uh, you know, connecting Asia and, and Europe. It's one city, but it's had many names. The area has been occupied at least as far back as 7,000 BC. In 680 BC, uh, uh, the Greeks um, formed a colony there. They named it Byzantium. It was conquered by the Romans about 500 years later. And, or that, yeah, yeah, about 500 years later by the Romans in 195 BC. They continued to call it Byzantium. It was made a Roman colony. Now, in the year 324 AD, Constantine, who became the first uh, who decriminalized, who was famous for having decriminalized Christianity, uh, was emperor. And he decided he would move his capital from Rome to Byzantium. He called, he renamed the city briefly, he called it New Rome, but very quickly it took on the name Constantinople, which means the city of Constantine. Now, the Ottomans conquered it in 1400 AD. And from that time, it was changed to its Arabic name, which is Istanbul, and it gradually, gradually replaced the name of uh, the name Constantinople. This was my view from my hotel room. My hotel was actually hotel room was actually teensy tiny, and um, our room was very small, but it had such a beautiful view uh, uh, of the. Uh, my room was very small. It had a beautiful view, though, out of the window. And I could lift the window up. It was a full-length window. It was one of those ones you can lift up and walk out on this uh, rooftop that had been turned into a small patio. So I was quite privileged. It was absolutely beautiful. I was there in the summertime. There's my picture right here, standing in front of the hotel. The hotel uh, is on a beautiful little square wonderful older buildings in an older part of the city, not the old S because it's an awfully old city, but there's just quite lovely with some outdoor dining and, and here's a beautiful couple sitting there. It was right near the Galati Tower. This was actually, a uh, tower was built by, uh, by Italians who during the Renaissance period, they formed a colony here in Istanbul to do trading with the, uh, with the, with the Ottoman Empire. And they brought a lot of artisans and a lot of Italians lived here. And they built this tower in their section of the city. And actually it was built originally as to watch for fires, but of course it could be used as a, as a lookout. It was a lookout tower for, to, uh, 
watch for fires in the city, of course, which were very devastating. And uh, but it also, of course, could be used as a fortress. But you wouldn't build a fortress in the middle of uh, the Ottoman Empire. So they built instead of a fortress, they built a rather substantial fire tower. Well, I have to admit, I love that bread. I thought this was a great picture, but that bread is delicious. It's this wonderful bread. It kind of reminds me of pretzels, but softer. And it's got wonderful sesame seeds on the outside, uh, you know, like soft, big soft baked pretzels. But it's, it's even better than that. It just is delicious. And you can buy it all over the city in a lot of the Middle Eastern cities. I used to get it in Jerusalem also. Uh, of course, it's a fairly modern city with modern conveniences. This is their light rail system, and uh, it's a bustling city. They consider themselves, uh, at least at the time I was there, it was 98% Muslim, uh, but they were many of the people were secular Muslims, and the government considered itself secular. Now, this is quite impressive. This is the hippo this is the site of the Hippodrome. It's also now it's called Sultan Ahmet Square. But the Romans at the time of Const back in the uh, when it was when it was Constantinople, right here where the Blue Moss stands now is where the palace of the Byzant of the Byzantine emperors stood. Uh, the Byzantine period dates from the time that Constantine in 324 moved his empire from Rome to Byzantium. And then the, the Roman Empire continued to be called the Byzantine Empire. Eventually there would be the Western Empire would fall uh, in the year and around the, in the, about the 600s. And the Western Empire, uh, sixth century or so, the Western Empire would fall and the Eastern Empire continued on for another uh, six or seven hundred years. But this, you can, this is where the emperor's palace stood for the Byzantine Empire. This over here is the, the Hagia Sophia, or the Church of Divine Wisdom, often called the Church of Saint Sophia. And um, that was the, 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 the church of the, uh, in, of the Byzantine Empire, the main church in the Byzantine Empire. And this right here was a huge hippodrome. It's where they had the chariot races. This is the kind of place where Ben-Hur type chariot races occurred. And down the middle, they had their trophies from war. I've got a, uh, this is what the city looked like at the time of the, um, excuse me. This is, a, this is what the city would have looked like uh, back in the Byzantine, uh, on, and when the, at the height of the Byzantine Empire. And you can see the Hippodrome here with, it's been built up in order to be terrorist, almost like a terrace, so that the emperor, of course, wouldn't have to climb up and down a bunch of steps in order to go, in order to go to the, uh, in order to go to the games. And so that there'd be a large flat terraced area. He had to, they terraced it out in order to be an area large enough to have the chariot races. This middle section is called the spina of the, um, of the Hippodrome. And it was a place where they had all kinds of, you know, tremendous trophies, things that they have, that represented their conquests and their empires. This right here, we'll talk about later, but that's a bronze column that's been that's a column, uh, a stone column that's been clad in gilt bronze plaques. And um, these are all other trophies that have been brought from around the empire. Over here at the main entrance, you can't see it, but that's where there's four magnificent gilded bronze, bronze horses stand. And uh, we'll talk about them later. But it was quite impressive. A very impressive uh, city at the time of the rule of Byzantines. You can see this is where the the bronze horses stand, and these are the uh, these are the obelisks that are. This sort of just shows you the ones that are still left. Back at the time of uh, of the Byzantine emperors, of course, it had all kinds of uh, stuff. This is shows you where the area that was built up so that there would be that flat area. This was really impressive. 
This is an Egyptian obelisk. It's the obelisk of Tutmos III. It was, it was uh, originally built in 1490 BC, of course, in Egypt. But the emperor had it cut into three pieces and he moved it to, uh, to the, it was moved by the emperor Theodosius in the year 390. And it was placed along the spina by him. Of course, it's only 40 meters high here. Uh, it, they they lost 20. It stood originally stood 60 meters in height. But that's uh, I can't I couldn't believe that the hieroglyphics are still so legible. You know, 3,500 years later, and it's been out in the weather all this time. This right here, this is called the snake column, or the serpent column. It was originally, it's made of bronze, and it then stands along the spina of the old Hippodrome. And it was originally a trophy that stood in, in uh, Greece. It marked the victory of the Greeks over the Persians in the 5th century BC. It originally stood, uh, you can see it's a bronze column, and it originally, this is the level, of course, that it was, the spina was back uh, this column has not been lifted up and brought to current to current levels. It's still at the lower level uh, that archaeologically where it would have stood at the time of the uh, Emperor Theodosius. And um, but this this actually this serpent column stood at the Temple of Apollo in Delphi in Greece. If you remember, Delphi was the home of the Oracle of Delphi, the, the famous Oracle of Delphi. And Apollo is the god of, uh, of prof and one of the things Apollo controls is prophecy. But it was brought to the Hippodrome uh, by Constantine brought this one. Excuse me. Theodosius brought the uh, the Egyptian obelisk of Tutmos III, and, but Constantine himself is the one who brought the serpent column to the Hippodrome. This is what it uh, originally looked like. You can see the serpent heads. The, the column is actually three entwined snakes, and then it supports a, gold, a, gold, a gilded or golden brazier up at the top. This is an artist's rendering of what the spina would have looked like originally. Of course, there were many things originally located. We know this from descriptions of, uh, that have been by Roman historians that recorded what was going on at the, you know, back at that time. Now this column is not very impressive, but remember I told you about the stone column that was encased in bronze plaques? Well, this is the, uh, that is the that is the walled obelisk. Unfortunately, the gilded the gold gilded bronze plaques were sacked in the year 1200 by the Crusaders. I find that really disturbing. The Crusades were allegedly about freeing the Holy Land from the from the uh, from the Ottoman Empire from the Muslims from Muslim control so that Christians could travel in safety. But so much of it was just about money and power because the Crusaders sacked Istanbul, I mean Constantinople, and in the, in the year 1200. In the year 1200, it was still, everyone in Constantinople was still, uh, was still Christian. This was the Eastern Christian Rome uh, Empire, Byzantine Empire. It's true, it would soon fall to the, uh, within a hundred years or so or more, it was gonna fall to the, uh, to the, to the, uh, to the Muslims, but it hadn't at this time. It was in decline in power, but it was sacked and looted by the Crusaders. I mean, the Crusades, oh, it's about the Crusades so much. Some people went there idealistic, but the vast majority of the people who were in control of what happened were about money and power and, and they didn't care, care about who they killed in order to achieve it. These are the gilded bronze horses that stood at the entrance of the Hippodrome. They're absolutely gorgeous, but they're not in, 
in Constantinople or modern Istanbul. Instead, in that looting in 1204, they were, uh, they were looted by the Crusaders in the 12th century. And this particular group of Crusaders apparently came from Venice and they carried them back. And they now, as you can see them, they stand in St. Mark's Pal, St. Mark's in Venice, St. Mark's Cathedral in Venice. Well, on the site of the old Byzantine Empire, the Byzantine Imperial Palace uh, in 1690, after the Ottomans had taken over the area, they built a huge mosque and they called it the Blue Mosque. It's incredibly large. This is just the courtyard. Right there is a water fountain, uh, fountain because washing is part of what uh, Muslims do before prayer. You can see this large courtyard, the great uh, mosque. It has six minarets and though I don't, the time I visited, which was actually back in uh, 2005, 2006, when I visited Istanbul, there was n no other uh, mosque that had as many as six minarets because it was the mosque of the Sultan, of the ruler of the Ottoman Empire. It was not every other mosque in the world would not have six minarets. They had five or less. I don't know if that's still true. But the inside of the Blue Mosque, you can see why it has the name the Blue Mosque. These are Iznik tiles, which were some of the finest tiles that were made at that time. There are over 20 thousand of them. They have a classic blue and white color that is just impressive. The outside of the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem, that gold dome thing you see when you see all the pictures of Jerusalem, the outside is covered by Isnik tiles and they were the finest tiles that was made. And this place is absolutely gorgeous. I did much of like these people are doing. I sat there and I stared up at it. It was so impressive. They were, they were wonderful. Now, if you'll notice, most of this is floral designs and other designs. There's script, which are quotes, quotes from the Quran, but you don't see figures of people. Portraying people is discouraged in the Muslim, um, in, in the Muslim beliefs. Now, one place I was anxious to see was the Hagia Sophia. So you walk, oh, it's a walk, uh, a couple of blocks or so across this wonderful park-like area. And I'm headed for the Hagia Sophia. The Hagia Sophia is the, was the church built, uh, which, was, which was built under the Byzantine Empire and was until the building of St. Peter's in Rome, the, in the Renaissance period, was the largest church in all of Christendom. After the Ottomans took over, the, the minarets were added. Uh, it was used as a mosque and they called people to prayer here. Of course, you're going to run into to, to, uh, people. These, are tr these gentlemen are in traditional Turkish dress and what they carry on their back actually is cherry juice. And they have this little show about the way they pour their cherry juice, and it's quite impressive. And cherry juice is actually very good. I don't know why we don't have it here in the United States, but it's very popular, at least in Turkey. But the Hagia Sophia, as I said, is, is just huge and impressive. It was, as I said, the largest, the largest uh, church in all of Christendom until St. Peter's was built. Uh, it was... It was the, uh, there was a church that was built on that site earlier, but uh, this particular, the Hagia Sophia was, was built in 537 on the site of pre where churches had been. It's famous also for having been the site of the Great Schism. You see, Christianity was just one faith for the first thousand years of Christianity. There were different traditions and different rites, but it was just all one church. The bishops had all been considered equal. If you remember, there were ecumenical councils. Those are gatherings of bishops. They're led by the five patriarchs, which are the patriarchs of Constantinople and Alexandria, Jerusalem, Antioch, and Rome. 
And those are the five patriarchs who are the leaders among equals is the way they were considered. And they were considered equal to each other. However, the patriarch of Rome, who was also called the Pope, uh, there was emerged after about the in the late uh, in the late medieval period there began to be well in the middle excuse me i don't know about my medieval periods but probably around six seven hundred eight hundred there began to emerge a, a doctrine in in rome that because rome uh the first bishop of rome was peter and peter was the leader of all of the apostles that he and he was their leader and the and the current pope patriarch of of rome the pope was the successor to peter that made him supreme among the patriarchs the other patriarchs and the rest of the eastern church didn't take that view but the western church did and tensions continued to rise and conflict until finally in 1054 uh, the uh, papal legate stood at the altar of, of the Hagia Sophia, the papal ambassador, basically the ambassador from the from the Pope in Rome, uh, stood at the altar and excommunicated the Patriarch of Constantinople, and then the Patriarch of Constantinople excommunicated the Pope, and it stood that way really until the 20th century. And in my own lifetime, I'd see those those excommunications lifted, and there's been a lot more move toward uh, unity and understanding between the Eastern and the Western uh, churches of Christianity. Well, this is just a huge church. This particular picture here, uh, this is, you know, it is it is a huge church. I couldn't believe how large it was. Uh, my, this is my seminary professor, Dr. Witherington, and he said this was kind of the shock and awe uh, period of the of Christianity, where they wanted to impress you with the with the glory and grandeur of God and remind you of how small you were. And I have to admit, considering most people would not have had the opportunity to come to a place like this, or if they did, it was just once in their lives. From And you lived in villages and small places. It must have been absolutely overwhelming. Because the inside of the church is so huge that actually you could fit a village of a thousand people including your, your farmlands, all there, you know, uh, including your, your associated farmlands and pasture lands, all there underneath the dome of this church. And the dome, you see, is gold, like the gold of heaven, and it was just really, really impressive. These great shields here are very classic uh, 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 Ottoman, done under the Ottoman rule, uh, the Muslim when it was a when it was a mosque and was done by one of their great artists and much of his of these works continue uh, at the time I visited the Hagia Sophia was now a museum it had been used as a place of Muslim worship uh, under the Ottomans but it became a museum in uh, 1931 I believe now it has been converted back to a mosque, though I'm not 100%. I think I saw something about that on the news recently. But it was a just totally impressive. I mean, you can see how much would fit under here. And this, though it's under the Great Dome, there's still more area that you just can't quite picture. You're only looking down one half of it. This is an angel. If you remember, the seraphim have uh, six wings, two here, two here, and two here. I always had trouble picturing that, the way the seraphim were described in the Bible. Oh, here we go. This is the Empress, Theodo the, the Empress Zoe in the 11th century. She was quite popular, and this was her first husband was there first. The, the one who was the emperor at the time. But 
he actually uh, was overthrown and she married again and uh, so she had his face chipped out in the face of her second husband here and when she married for a third time I don't remember exactly how she had the third she had the the face of her second husband removed and the face of her third husband was put here <laughs> So, you know, you don't usually think about women being such power, powerful rulers back in the 11th century, but Zoe was extremely popular and was quite a powerful empress. And of course here, she's presenting the title to the church to, uh, to the Blessed Virgin and the infant Jesus. Her husband is bringing money. She's, she's giving the title to the church. Now, just, a, just not far from there, uh, the entrance to the cisterns of the Basilica. Uh, it was really the largest ancient cistern uh, that we know of was in Istanbul. It held 100,000 tons of, of uh, water, and it's located 30 feet below the street. It was the Basilica cistern, and it was built in 532 AD, the same time the current Hagia Sophia was built. And this is the one probably if you've seen movies, it's often featured in movies. I think um, one of those Tom Hanks uh, movies, uh, it's featured here. But that was the way it was used. And they actually sort of, um, remember they're building in the fifth, in, five, in, 530, in 532 by Justinian. And he used reclaimed materials, which means he went and tore down pagan temples that might still be around. And uh, he used them here. If you notice, the faces are either set on their side or set upside down. The reason for that is they believe that it took the power away from the figure or the, or the pagan god. It showed that he had no more, that he had no power and was given no respect. So here are some of the very impressive things that they've recycled from pagan temples. There's actually fish in there, which is which is really kind of strange, but they're there. Now, the next thing was I was lucky enough to have an audience, my seminary group was, to have an audi audience with the ecumenical patriarch of um, the ecumenical patriarch of of uh, of Constantinople. That's the Patriarch of Constantinople. Uh, it, I think he's the 200 and I know I don't remember which number he is, but he's in a direct line from the original Patriarchs of Constantinople. And uh, his name is uh, Bartholomew the first. So we, this is the church where his original church, of course, would have been the Patriarch of Constantinople was located at the Hagia Sophia, but it, uh, he is now here at the Church of St. George. The church is very impressive. Uh, this is a beautiful carved gilded screen and then chandeliers, just quite impressive. Uh, we were we were in there for a service and an audience. And this is uh, my little picture of Bartholomew here. And uh, we were able to see him right there, which was really very impressive actually. And then he met with our seminary group. See, this is Dr. Witherington. This is my, uh, the president, the then president. He was president at that time of Asbury Seminary. And I'm right here and uh, we met with him. Uh, it was quite, uh, his English is excellent, and he, uh, there's a problem in that the requirements are you must be trained at a seminary and be a graduate from a seminary located in Turkey. However, the government closed the last seminary in Turkey about 30, 30 something years ago. So there are very few priests that are eligible to be successors to Bartholomew. So it will be interesting to see if Christianity survives, if uh, the, the patriarch 
the, the uh, patriarchy see of uh, Constantinople continues uh, and who will succeed him. Well, after all that, I wanted some food and this is some really good, it's the way they do their meat and their lamb all over the Middle East. I think this is, I believe, uh, you know, like to make the, the gyro sandwiches and he posed for us. This is another church sort of on the outskirts of the city. And it has, it is known for its extremely, uh, it's a very, it was not used, I don't think as a, I think it was used as a school under, is, under Islamic rule, but uh, it has been largely restored and it's very impressive. This is Topiki, pa Top keep Top Piki Palace. It was one of the major auto, uh, residences of the Ottoman Sultans for over 400 years, from about 1465 to 1856. The palace has four main courtyards, many, 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 many other buildings, and uh, at its peak, it was as home to as many as. 40,000 people covered a large area. It had a shoreline. It contained moss and and bakeries and, and even a mint. This is a view from the Bosphorus looking up toward Topiki Palace right here. And um, it was quite impressive. And uh, there were harem rooms and quite all that kind of thing. Just, uh, I believe this air, this section right here was for the harem. It's quite impressive. <sighs> Beautiful. There's those Isnik tiles again that we talked about. <sighs> the palace is absolutely gorgeous. But then, what would you th expect? The Ottomans, Ottoman Empire ruled for oh, what 600 years. 650 years, 624 years, and uh, just absolutely spectacular. This is sort of down more on the level of the Bosphorus, and this is called the um, the Grand Kiosk of the of the of the palace. Just uh, gorgeous. This was a throne room. I believe this was uh, that's a solid so, that was a solid gold ceremonial throne, and this is one of the harem rooms right here. Oh, this is the golden throne. I'm sorry, this is the solid gold golden throne that the Ottoman sat on. This is a uh, gorgeous dagger. Look at the emeralds in that thing. And that's called the Topkipi Dagger. This is a huge, you know, of course they had a large collection of gems and everything. This is this is 86 carats, pear, a pear-shaped diamond. Just spectacular. Well, after viewing the palaces, see, uh, there's the Hagia Sophia right there. We went on a ride on the Bosphorus, a boat ride. It's something everybody does. The Bosphorus connects the Sea of Marmi and the Black Sea, and it separates Europe and Asia. Ah, it was quite lovely. You can see the Galata Tower, which is right near my hotel, back behind my head. It's quite, uh, quite lovely. This particular one here is one of the Ottoman, this was a palace uh, and it had famous Ottoman parties where, where uh, parties were held here, very famous parties held here in the gardens with, uh, and these were tu tulip gardens were maintained here and they would be torchlight. Here's another palace. This is the, uh, Dolomachi Palace, and I'm sure I didn't pronounce any of that right, but it's located on about 11 acres and has 285 rooms. And on the first floor chandeliers alone, there's over four and a half tons of crystals. It's really, really impressive. 
it is huge, huge. This is the palace, I suppose. Now, this is the one with the with the crystal chandeliers I was talking about. Four and a half tons of crystals. Absolutely impressive. This is a lighthouse there on the on the Bosphorus. Well, this is our first stop. It's the spice market. And this is just the way you would have come up to it back uh, in antiquity. And I have to admit, it was very impressive. It's not as large as the Grand Bazaar, but uh, as you can see, it was built in about states from about 1500. And there's all these spices that are available, and it's a great sensation to the senses, you s the smells, and just the, the everything. And by the time you start looking around, there's somebody who wants to have their picture taken with you. <laughs> I, I went ahead and fed the pigeons, which is a traditional thing to do. And I have to admit that was a lot of fun. Now, then we went to the Turkey, uh, the Turkish Museum of Archaeology, which is absolutely spectacular. Of course, I mentioned earlier that remember, this was the capital of the Roman Empire and of the of the, the Byzantine Empire and the Ottoman Empire. So basically, people who controlled much of the much of the world, well, a large portion of of, uh, of the Western world and the Middle Eastern world, they were they would bring all the trophies and would bring them here to their capital city. This is actually something. It's one of the few things that still exist from the temple that existed at the time of Jesus. And it is the temple inscription. It was the one that says that uh, stood between the court of the Gentiles and the inner uh, court of the temple, one of the inner courts of the temple. It said, no foreigner may enter within the balustrade around the sanctuary and the enclosures. Whoever is caught on himself shall be the blame for the death that will ensue. Very, uh, if you remember in, in Acts, there's a section where Paul is accused of having brought a Gentile into the inner courts, you know, beyond this barrier, which he did not, but he was accused of it. This here is the Treaty of Kadesh. It is dates from the year 1247 BC, Ramses II. It was a treaty between Ramses II and the Hittite Empire. And it's the first known treaty between two uh, empires. These are the Ishtar, Ishtar gates. These are the gates that surrounded the city of Babylon. It was the Babylonian exile. If you remember, the Jews um, were taken into, ba the, the people of, of Judea were taken into Babylonian exile in the year 598 BC, and they returned to Jerusalem 70 years later. But these were the gates, the actual gates or tiles from the gates that they walked past. This was what the gates would have looked like. Uh, this actually is not from uh, is not from from the from there. This is actually from uh, an exhibit in I think Berlin, uh, where the gates, where most of the archaeological, uh, in other words. Basically, in the, in the 1800s, in the early 1900s, when much of this archaeology was being done, European countries would sponsor it, and then they would carry it all back to their own museums. That's why the the uh, the statues from the frieze of the Parthenon of Greece are located in the British Empire, and the Ishtar gates of Babylon are located, I believe, in a German museum. It was quite an impressive walk. Can you imagine being brought there in exile and having to walk down this area uh, through these gates into the city of Babylon, knowing that your homeland has been destroyed and you are a slave in exile? <sighs> this is... Uh, this right here is actually one of the sarcophagi of uh, Alexander the Great. 
When Alexander the Great died, they made copies of his sarcophagi uh, and they brought them around, though his remains were not in it, they brought them around and uh, through you know two different places so people could honor uh, the great Alexander. However, back at the time of Alexander, what we think of as these wonderful white marble statues and that white marble sarcophagus was actually polychromed. It was painted. This is a reconstruction of what it looked like according to the trace colors that they've been able to find through sign, sort of a forensic exam of the modern of the existing statue. You can see bits and pieces of the paint. We went on to the Grand Bazaar. The Grand Bazaar is, is a covered bazaar inside the old walled city. It has over 40,000 shops, I mean 4,000 shops, and it gets so, oh, between 250 to a half a million visitors every day. Of course, I'm sure that's pre-pandemic, but it goes on and on. This is just tremendous look at this huge area of the of the grand bazaar all these are connected and you can walk through all of this and you never real you never go outside this is an indoor shopping mall folks before before we thought malls were popular and there's food and it's everything you could possibly buy and you go on and on and on and if i didn't have a guide i would have surely gotten lost but it was a joy and a pleasure to go through here and we eventually found some place where we had some delicious food and ended our day at at uh, ended which brought an end to my my day in istanbul quite memorable when i got home well, I hope you enjoyed my reflections about a day I spent in Istanbul and uh, I enjoy doing these breeze times with you, but uh, if there's something particular you'd like to talk about, then please let me know. Otherwise, I'll just continue to share um, my travels or my thoughts on, on things that are going on today, and I hope you enjoy it. Until next time, God bless you.